Hi, this is Lily DeHoya Sanderson. I want to welcome you to another episode of Choosing Glory podcast. And see if I can say that three times fast. I really appreciate your joining me. And welcome to those who are watching on YouTube. As always, increased vulnerability to be visible on YouTube. And I have to actually put lipstick on, so I hope you all appreciate that. Now, if you are trying to find it on YouTube, the searches are still a little bit slow, but I think if you search Lily Anderson podcast, Choosing Glory podcast, those are some of the terms I put in there, and it should come up. So I have noticed that a lot of you have already viewed some of these videos on YouTube and have subscribed. Thank you so much for that kind of support. And as usual, I really want to thank you, Patreon subscribers, who are actually making the podcast continue, and hopefully it will continue to grow so that I can maintain this way of trying to build the kingdom a little bit and hopefully promote Zion, right? So if you are interested in supporting the podcast and getting access to additional content, please go to patreon.com forward slash choosing glory, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash choosing glory and subscribe. And I really appreciate that. I appreciate all of you who are watching and listening as well. Now, let's talk about a little sad current event here that I'm sure many of you know about and maybe have seen more than I have, but I did hear from some of my kids and I did see something online about David Archuleta, who, bless his heart, has written a song called Hell Together. And I didn't look at the lyrics or anything, but I suppose, I mean, I understand that the point is that he has lost his faith and has left the church and that his mother has expressed support to her son at a level that means that they're going to hell together. Isn't that the gist of the song? At any rate, I know that that message is out there a lot and that sometimes even people who profess to be and maybe consider themselves to be active and involved Latter-day Saints will talk about how important it is to show love to family members who are struggling and they will talk about a child who's leaving the faith or who's choosing an alternate lifestyle or sexuality or identity, all that kind of stuff. And that they want to express their love by becoming an ally or a supporter for that child in that activity. Now, I know these things are really hard. And can I just say that my heart breaks for everybody involved? It breaks for David Archuleta. How tragic that he is struggling with his faith. He has a great talent. He's shared it in so many wonderful ways. This is sad. And my heart breaks for his mother and everybody else who cares about him. And it breaks for everybody who has people in their lives that they care about and love who are losing their way in one form or another. And that's happening all over the place, right? None of us are completely untouched by that. We all know people who have turned away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we know they're in pain. There's something that has gone wrong in their lives and they are struggling to deal with it. But sadly, their struggle is pulling them away from God and not toward God. I've quoted this before, but my wise mother told me, and I must have been pretty young still, 10, 11, 12, I don't know, we were still in Indiana. And one time she told me, it's okay to be angry at God as long as you tell him about it. And those wise words have stayed with me throughout a lot of tough times, including this current tough time, that it's okay to be angry at God as long as we keep coming back to him to talk it through, to work out our pain, to reassure ourselves of his great love, his understanding. The fact is that our Savior descended below all things for the very purpose that he could comprehend them and succor us in our affliction. And he does. He does. He's always there. We may not feel him every moment when our pain or grief or other emotions rise up to such intense levels. But as soon as we can pause and reflect and give it a little time, he's right there. And he's there even when we can't feel him. So it's a choice to trust in him and know that he does understand this kind of pain, the heartbreak of going through our own crises and hurts and the heartbreak of having someone that we love go through those things. But the answer, as we have heard eloquently put in conference, 
in many ways, but one of the ways that we heard just last year, I think, was, you know, stay by the tree. If we really want to help our loved ones, we stay by the tree. We don't leave the only source of true healing. Like, why would we abandon the only source of ultimate joy in the entire system of life and eternity? We're going to turn our back on the one who offers us everything in order to assuage a temporary, it may seem like it lasts forever, and, you know, time is tough that way, isn't it? It can seem like one day can last forever when we're in pain, but it doesn't last forever. We're creatures of eternity, brothers and sisters. We are meant for something more than just this mortal life. But what we do in this mortal life has such an impact on what our eternity will be. And our prophets keep reminding us of that. The scriptures remind us that these prophets have been sharing this message forever with God's people, with all who would listen. So stay by the tree. And of course, that refers to the tree of life, to the fountain of living water to Jesus Christ himself, to trust him and to trust that he will help us know how to help our loved ones better if we don't abandon him. I mentioned this story before, but I'm going to mention it again. I had a client couple that came to see me once, and for a while they came, and they had a teenage daughter who was losing her faith and abandoning the principles and standards of the gospel of Jesus Christ and you know, involved in some pretty serious behaviors that were problematic and sinful, and their hearts were breaking. And at one point, the father, who was a good guy, but he turned to me and he said, if it would help this daughter, I'll leave the church. I'll leave the church if it would mean, you know, that I could help my daughter. And I mean, they knew my position on things, but I I mean, again, I'm not saying this because I don't care. It's because I care. But I said, oh, oh, please. I'm like, so then how could you come more strongly and purely and appropriately before the Lord and plead for help for your daughter? If you turn away yourself from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, how can you bless her if she ever wants a blessing? How can you use the great gifts that God has given us, having priesthood in our homes, having the temple covenants? How can you rely on all those things to petition the Lord on her behalf and to be an example of light and truth? How can you reflect the light of Christ if you turn away from it? Why would you give away the greatest resource you have to help your daughter in a mistaken attempt that that will help your daughter? Oh, stay by the tree, brothers and sisters. My heart breaks for all those people who are suffering, but it really breaks in a deeper level for those who turn away from the very source of light, truth, and eternal life. Well, Remember, this is not healthy love. Our prophets have been telling us lately that we need to put our love for God first. And I love that. I, mean, I love that Elder Christofferson's message at a BYU speech a while ago now, talking about keeping our first love first. If we put God first, the first commandment being our love for God, then our love for our fellow men, and more especially even for those closest to us, will be a stronger love, a healthier love. Truth is what helps people, not joining them in error. Okay, let me share this. This is a nice statement by Bruce Hafen, and it's connected. So give me a minute to connect it, okay? It's from a speech called The Disciples' Journey at BYU in February of 2008. Every day we hear messages of indulgence, like pampering yourself, like this isn't just indulgent, it's decadent, but you deserve it. I saw a billboard in Utah recently. Modesty has never been sexier. Talk about double-mindedness. Now, this is a great one here. You know, <laughs> modesty has never been sexier. 
And then, yes, Elder Hafen appropriately refers to this as double-mindedness. Like, what's the message there, right? So he goes on. We live in a society that seems to have no higher aim than its own indulgent satisfaction. So even, even this attempt, you know, on the billboard of trying to follow the standards, but to what purpose, you know, to incite sexiness and lust or, I mean, anyway, he goes on. Many people feel they have a right to indulge themselves eating too much, spending too much, and reveling in creature comforts. But as one friend said, if you don't get out of your comfort zone, you won't learn. Now, we know that, right? Nobody grows in a comfort zone. And as our prophets remind us that God is not concerned with our comfort, he's concerned with our progress and growth. And if you don't learn, Elder Hafen says, you won't grow. And without growth, you won't find joy. That's a high price to pay for indulging in self-satisfied comfort no growth, and no joy. Brothers and sisters, that's such an important principle. We so often get waylaid by our desire for comfort. And don't get me wrong. I mean, we enjoy comfort. I enjoy comfort. But that's not what life is about. Can you imagine no growth and no joy if that were our primary goal, to, to be comfortable? Too often, our children are too comfortable. And this has become a real problem in their own growth and in their own lives. And we see even that some of them can't tolerate the discomforts of a mission. And a mission is temporary. It's 18 months or two years. And yes, it's often uncomfortable. In fact, it's necessarily going to be uncomfortable. They're away from the things that normally give them security or ease or, you know, the routines of their lives. And look at the growth that can happen. Look at the joy that can happen on a mission if they embrace that endeavor and grow rather than complain or become really disturbed and distressed because they're not comfortable. And have we set them up for success as they grow by talking to them about the things that make them uncomfortable. And, you know, life makes us uncomfortable. Do we rescue them too much from that? I mean, growing up with brothers and sisters is uncomfortable when people have to take turns or they don't immediately get all the things that they want. You know, that can help them to become a little more resilient and hopefully eventually anti-fragile, which is something we've talked about in the past, and we'll talk about again. But okay, last thought by Elder Hafen. This double-mindedness has consequences. We cannot be perfected in Christ. Now, this is a great statement. Not because Christ lacks the power, but because we just lack the discipline. Thank heaven, repentance can restore discipline. This is a great statement, and I guess I'm tacking it on here to what we were saying before about not going away from the tree, because that's double-mindedness. That's a different kind of double-mindedness. You know, I love the gospel. I love the Lord. And because I know families are so important, you know, I'm, I can't turn away from this suffering child or spouse, so I have to follow them into the ditch, the blind leading the blind right into the ditch as we have been warned against. But let me read this last part again. I like it so much. Double-mindedness has consequences. We cannot then be perfected in Christ, not because he lacks the power, but because we just lack the discipline. Thank heaven, repentance can restore discipline. There is a way back, but let's find it as quickly as possible and not waste time away from the tree. And these, these thoughts give me comfort in my circumstances that, that's ironic, they give me comfort to realize that being uncomfortable helps us grow. I am counting on the Lord using this time in me to work his alchemy, turning the lead in my life into gold, and the remaining dross in my system hopefully being burned out by the discomfort of stretching and grief during this time. Well, Enos is a tremendous example that we look to a lot, and we hear a lot of examples about his mighty prayer and his desire to connect with God. Sometimes, however, and obviously we don't have enough information here to make an absolute proof of this, but my 
contention is that Enos was not repenting of a sinful life. I know sometimes people have said that. And I am not suggesting we can't repent of a sinful life. Of course we can. We just quoted Elder Hafen again, reminding us that repentance can restore discipline. Nevertheless, I don't think that's what's going on here with Enos. I'm pretty sure that what's happening with Enos is that he is petitioning the Lord for sanctification. And we've talked about this wonderful doctrine of sanctification that is the commandment of the Lord, that the saints should sanctify themselves. And we've talked about how that means the complete reception of the Holy Ghost, and not just in a way that is confirmed upon us after baptism, but in a way that completes the promise of confirmation, that fulfills that mandate given to us by someone holding the Melchizedek priesthood, who officiates in that confirmation and says, receive the Holy Ghost. And that that doesn't mean now you have it. It means now go qualify for it. Seek sanctification. And yes, we get access to many blessings that the Holy Ghost can provide in that journey, but we don't get the constant companionship until we have demonstrated, and I call this, you know, the boring consistency of obedience, that we become boringly consistent, that the Lord can count on our obedience. We're not all over the place. We're not volatile where when she was good, she was very, very good. But when she was bad, she was horrid, like the nursery rhyme says. We're not up and down in our obedience. We are compliant and we have yielded our natural man appetites and desires to the desires of God and to our obedience to the commandments in order to qualify for this great gift of the Holy Ghost that can purify us. And I believe that's what's happening here with Enos. I think he knew about the doctrine of sanctification and he hungered for it. And that's what it says. Verse four, my soul hungered. So he cries to God in supplication for his own soul all the day long through the night. And we know the story. And he is told that his sins are forgiven. Now that does happen at the time of sanctification. So again, this doesn't mean that this is like his first attempt at repentance. It wouldn't have been such a mighty experience if he's just now, you know, I mean, this doesn't sound to me like the Alma story. This is a different story. I believe Enos was a righteous son of a righteous prophet, Jacob, and he heard the words of his father and believed them. And so he wanted to complete this process to have the reception of the Holy Ghost so that the Holy Ghost could be his constant companion and he could be purified. Remember that the baptism of fire, which is sanctification, it's the baptism of the Holy Ghost, means that by the power of the Holy Ghost, we are cleansed and our sins really are remitted at that time. Not that God hasn't been forgiving us as we repent, but it is complete at this time of sanctification. And the elements of impurity are actually cleansed from our physical bodies. And with it comes a witness of Jesus Christ that comes from the Holy Ghost, which is stronger than sight, touch, or any of the other senses. So this sanctification makes us absolute in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. I believe that our apostles, who are called as special witnesses, are then required to become or be sanctified. And I have read in some of the writings of some of our Latter-day prophets and apostles their quest for this when they were called to be apostles because they knew that they would be special witnesses and they knew that what was required to be a special witness of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is this knowledge that comes by the Holy Ghost. So back to Enos, let's look at what happens. And this is a beautiful sequence or follow-up that happens. What does he say? In verse 9, now it came to pass that when I had heard these words, I began to feel a desire for the welfare of my brethren, the Nephites. Now that's lovely, isn't it? Because when we have been warned, it behooves us to warn our neighbor. And that's what happens to Enos. He has felt this wonderful, wonderful gift of sanctification. And immediately he wants to warn his neighbor. And the people he loves are the Nephites, so he starts to pray for the Nephites. And that—that that is that great extension of love that comes from God. 
the endowment of charity, in fact. And then he gets some promises concerning the Nephites. God gives him some assurances that he won't forget them, even if they, you know, <laughs> there are some promises. Of course, they can't screw up too badly, right? But then what happens is, then in verse 11, after I, Enos, had heard these words, my faith began to be unshaken in the Lord, and I prayed unto him with many long strugglings for my brethren, the Lamanites. And I think that's beautiful. That first, he desires his own redemption through the purifying and sanctifying baptism of fire that comes by the power of the Holy Ghost. And when he receives that assurance, he immediately wants to pray for his brethren, the Nephites, that he more obviously and naturally loves. But once he receives some assurances on their behalf, he prays for his enemies. So look how that charity extends once we have received that great gift. We can really love our enemies as did Enos. Anyway, it's a beautiful example. Now, I wanted to share something that I think is instructive and relevant to this. So I'm going to read something from Eliza R. Snow's writings concerning her brother, Lorenzo Snow, of course, one of our early Latter-day prophets in this dispensation. And she's quoting the words of Lorenzo Snow. So this is his writing as reported by his sister when she put together a biography of her brother. I was baptized by Elder John Boynton, then of the Twelve Apostles. Previous to accepting the ordinance of baptism, in my investigations of the principles taught by the Latter-day Saints, which I proved by comparison to be the same as those mentioned in the New Testament taught by Christ and his apostles. So that's a pretty important aside. In other words, Lorenzo Snow was a student of the scriptures. He was a gospel scholar, and he wanted to understand the New Testament church and the teachings of Jesus Christ to his disciples, and then the apostles' teachings to the early Christian church as they shared the message of Jesus Christ following his death and resurrection. So he was well acquainted with those principles taught in the New Testament by Christ and his apostles. And he said that they were the same. And as he studied Latter-day Saint doctrine, he proved by comparison that they were the same as those taught in the New Testament by Christ and his apostles. I was thoroughly convinced that obedience to those principles would impart miraculous powers. So he knew of the promises that are given concerning obedience to these principles. I was thoroughly convinced that obedience to those principles would impart miraculous powers, manifestations, and revelations with sanguine expectation of this result. And the word sanguine, not we don't use it very often, but it means optimistic or positive. So he had a very positive and optimistic expectation that he would receive those powers and manifestations and revelations that were promised by obedience to the principles taught by the Latter-day Saints that matched up with the New Testament teachings of Christ and the apostles, right? That's what he's saying. So I received baptism, you know, with that expectation and the ordinance of laying on of the hands by one who professed to have divine authority and having thus yielded obedience to these ordinances, I was in constant expectation of the fulfillment of the promise of the reception of the Holy Ghost. Now think about that. Now he was an adult, okay, so we don't expect our eight-year-olds to understand or be prepared for this necessarily, but we should be teaching that this is the end of that path and the end of that invitation to receive the Holy Ghost. It is sanctification that we are being offered when we are baptized and then confirmed and commanded to receive the Holy Ghost. Now, Lorenzo Snow is an adult, and he has studied his whole life. Obviously, he was a righteous man and lived according to the precepts that he understood in Scripture, but he didn't have the rest of the story that the restoration of the gospel provided. And when he then is convinced after, and Lorenzo Snow, I don't know if you remember, but I think it took him a whole year. His sister Eliza was pretty quick to be baptized. She got enthusiastic and so on. And actually, I think that was a personality difference because when you look at her writings and the hymns, that she, anyway, wonderful woman that she was, I think she was one of those more action-oriented personalities. And so she sees the gospel and here she is. And I think Lorenzo Snow was more of a data collector, more of an inductive personality, more of an, so I think he was one more to collect a lot of data before he made a final decision and not necessarily trust his feelings. <laughs> Both personalities have strengths and weaknesses, but here's Lorenzo, who had spent a long time studying the gospel before 
he accepted baptism. But having studied so deeply, he understood that the baptism of fire that comes with the power to receive the Holy Ghost and receive the baptism of fire is connected to an authorized ordinance as taught in Scripture and taught by our Latter-day Saint doctrine. So he expects that, and he's very positive and optimistic about expecting that once he has these ordinances in place by proper authority, he's going to be sanctified because he had lived an obedient life, already harnessed the natural man, committed to God, all in, all of those things. These are powerful men and women who who made these sacrifices to join the early church with the expectation that promises would be fulfilled, right? So he was in constant expectation of the fulfillment of this promise to be baptized by fire or sanctified. The manifestation did not immediately follow my baptism as I had expected, but although the time was deferred when I did receive it, its realization was more perfect, tangible, and miraculous than even my strongest hopes had led me to anticipate. And here's the rest of the story. Some two or three weeks after I was baptized, one day while engaged in my studies, I began to reflect upon the fact that I had not obtained a knowledge of the truth of the work. Now, when he says he hadn't obtained a knowledge, he means the witness of the Holy Ghost, because he had already studied enough that he believed that the work was true. And that's why he chose to be baptized and confirmed. So he had a testimony of the Book of Mormon. He had a testimony that this was God's restored church. And then he follows that by following the entry of the covenant through baptism and confirmation. But then he's like, why haven't I received this baptism of fire? And that knowledge, that witness that is more sure than sight or feeling or touch or hearing all that stuff. And he began to feel very uneasy. I laid aside my books, left the house, and wandered around through the fields under the oppressive influence of a gloomy, disconsolate spirit. Now, isn't that amazing? Like, it seems to me wonderful. I remember reading this one, you know, decades ago, that he was so convinced of the promises that when he didn't have that sanctifying completion, that baptism of fire, after following the authorized entry into the covenant through the waters of baptism and the confirmation by someone with authority, he's gloomy. Wouldn't it be great if we had that same positive optimism about our entitlement? And I'm careful about that word, but we are entitled to certain blessings when we comply with God's requirements and conditions. And he had. And if we can bring ourselves, if we choose, and of course we can, if we choose to bring ourselves into obedience. And again, remembering we don't have to be perfected yet. That doesn't happen till the resurrection, but we do need to be diligent in our covenants, boringly consistent, dependable to the Lord. So look at this. He's surrounded by this darkness, a disconsolate spirit. While an indescribable cloud of darkness seemed to envelop me, I had been accustomed at the close of the day to retire for secret prayer to a grove a short distance from my lodgings. But at this time, I felt no inclination to do so. (laughs) He's like, I'm not sure I'm up for this because I'm depressed that I haven't been sanctified yet. Again, that's touching to me. And I think it's a real invitation to us to feel likewise to do the work, and then to have the faith that God will help us receive this great sanctifying power when we have qualified. The spirit of prayer had departed and the heavens seemed like brass over my head. At length, realizing that the usual time had come for secret prayer, I concluded I would not forego my evening service. Now, again, I think that's a beautiful manifestation of his submission to God, which is another thing I've been thinking about a lot lately. (laughs) It is hard sometimes to submit to the Lord when things don't go the way we want them. And that's when submission counts. I mean, and I, I've thought about how that hasn't, I mean, not that there haven't been trials in my life. Of course there have all through it here and there, but it never seemed that hard to submit to the Lord's will because it made sense to me. 
And while sometimes, yes, it required more humility and patience than other times, I kind of was okay wanting what God wants. But having lost Chris, I it has been harder. And I have been really trying to work on that and pray for that complete submission to God's will, because this isn't what I want, except that I do want what the Lord wants. So I, I want to reconcile my will with his and I love that part in the Bible Dictionary on Prayer that talks about how prayer isn't about getting God to agree with us. Basically, it's getting us to agree with God. So prayer is a great vehicle to help us reconcile our wills and submit. And that's what I see here with Lorenzo Snow. He's submitting, even though he didn't get the desires of his heart. He wanted those manifestations and promises that had been explained in Scripture and in doctrine, and he didn't get it. And yet he decided to pray because he always prayed in the evening and he's not going to forgo his normal pattern of speaking to the Lord, even though his heart is at least a little bit broken here. I knelt as I was in the habit of doing and in my accustomed retired place, but not feeling as I was wont to feel. And we all know what that can be like, but sometimes approach God when we don't feel like we want to feel or not feeling as connected as maybe we would, we do sometimes. I had no sooner opened my lips in an effort to pray than I heard a sound just above my head like the rustling of silken robes. Does that remind you of the day of Pentecost? The rushing of winds? And immediately the Spirit of God descended upon me, completely enveloping my whole person, filling me from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. And oh, the joy and happiness I felt. No language can describe the almost instantaneous transition from a dense cloud of mental and spiritual darkness into a refulgence of light and knowledge as it was at that time imparted to my understanding. I then received a perfect knowledge that God lives. That's the knowledge he wanted, the witness of the Holy Ghost, stronger than any of the senses. I received a perfect knowledge that God lives, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and of the restoration of the Holy Priesthood and the fullness of the gospel. It was a complete baptism, a tangible immersion in the heavenly principle or element, the Holy Ghost, and even more real and physical in its effects and upon every part of my system than the immersion by water, dispelling forever so long as reason and memory last, all possibility of doubt or fear in relation to the fact handed down to us historically that the babe of Bethlehem is truly the son of God. Also, the fact that he is now being revealed to the children of men and communicating knowledge the same as in apostolic times. I was perfectly satisfied as well I might be, for my expectations were more than realized. I think I may safely say in an infinite degree. I cannot tell how long I remained in the full flow of the blissful enjoyment and divine enlightenment, but it was several minutes before the celestial element which filled and surrounded me began gradually to withdraw. On arising from my kneeling posture with my heart swelling with gratitude to God, beyond the power of expression, I felt, I knew that he had conferred on me what only an omnipotent being can confer that which is of greater value than all the wealth and honors worlds can bestow. That night, as I retired to rest, the same wonderful manifestations were repeated and continued to be for several successive nights. The sweet remembrance of those glorious experiences from that time to the present bring them fresh before me, imparting an inspiring influence which pervades my whole being, and I trust will to the close of my earthly existence. That's what God offers. That's what he offers to each one of us. This is not only for apostles and prophets, brothers and sisters, it's for you and it's for me. When we completely submit, when we plead for sanctification, when we trust that we are entitled to those blessings when we are diligent in keeping the conditions of those blessings. Well, the time that they come is up to the Lord. And we see that here too. He 
Lorenzo expected that when he was baptized and confirmed, because that's when he had access to those things on an official covenant level. And the Lord had him wait a bit, and perhaps that constituted one more trial. Clearly it did, because he was sad about it and felt a little bit betrayed. And which of us doesn't understand those feelings? That sometimes when we feel like we've been obedient and good and we still don't get what we want, we feel that way. And yet God has in store for us something much more precious than any wealth and honors the world can bestow. Something more precious than all of those things. So, as the Lord continues through the Doctrine and Covenants, for sure, to, to invite the saints, we should sanctify ourselves. Now, of course, it is done by the power of the Holy Ghost and because of the atonement of Jesus Christ. But we are the ones who choose to comply with the conditions or not and to ask for these blessings or not. And remember, the road to sanctification is a sorrowful road because we do need to demonstrate, as Joseph Smith warned, but with a sanguine way, in a positive and optimistic way, that these things are bestowed when we have demonstrated that we will serve the Lord at all hazards. They're not dispensed to people with cheap faith. Who was it who talked in conference about cheap grace? No, I don't think that was conference. I think that was an interview I heard <laughs> with Eric Metaxas, which I'll actually refer to in another podcast sometime. But anyway, and it was from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for those of you who know about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I'll share that too in a later time. But okay, that's where that phrase comes from, just to attribute it correctly. It's not cheap grace, brothers and sisters. It costs all that we have, a willingness to put everything on the altar, to know of these things. And we can, we can, in the Lord's time and in the Lord's way. Okay, I think it's also nice to notice that Enos has another prayer for the Lord, and it is that he will protect the records. That's like in verse 13. And in verse 14, it's interesting, again, we just get a little bit of the taste of how difficult things were between the Nephites and the Lamanites. And it's not, it's not an easy road they're on. For at the present, our strugglings were vain in restoring them to the true faith. They're trying to teach the Lamanites the gospel, but they can't seem to get through. And they swore in their wrath that if it were possible, they would destroy our records and us and also the traditions of our fathers. Now, it's interesting to me that the Lamanites understood the power of the scriptures. Now, and they may not have accepted the scriptures, but they recognized there was power there and that it strengthened the Nephites. And so they swore to destroy not only the Nephites, but their records. I think that's interesting. And that makes sense then that if that was actually on the table and the Lamanites even articulated that threat, that the prophets, as Enos says his fathers had done, also prayed for the pres preservation of those records. Verse 15, I, knowing that the Lord God was able to preserve our records, I cried unto him continually. And again in 16, I did cry unto God that he would preserve the records. And he covenanted with me that he would bring them forth unto the Lamanites in his own due time. So these prophets that do get to see the future, as Nephi did, and it sounds like Jacob did, and maybe even Enos, could see that the Nephites would eventually dwindle in unbelief. But that was after their seeds had mixed at the time of Christ. Remember, that's coming, but the people do all blend. All the righteous become just one people as the wicked are destroyed. So they know that their seed will go on and the seed of their brothers in one form or another. So anyway, he knows that the Lord will preserve these records as a way of reaching them in the latter days. And the Lord does mention 18. This is the book of Enos, verse 18. The Lord said unto me, thy fathers have also required of me this thing. So in other words, they have been praying about this for some time, that the Lord would preserve the records for this great purpose. They know that they're not writing this book for their own people. Not that they're not teaching their own people these things, but the keeping of the record is for the future generations. It's for us. 
It's for us, the remnant of Israel. And as in this great Latter-day work of gathering Israel, the Book of Mormon becomes such a key element and such a powerful tool. Really marvelous that we have such access to these things in our day and all the other truths that we enjoy. So now this is something that I have thought about a lot, and I'm going to mention it here. Verse 20. I don't think people quote this very often, and I think maybe we should. So let's just read verse 23, actually. Well, you know, he talks about how stiff necked the Nephites are. Because that's pretty much the pattern of life, isn't it? That every succeeding generation struggles with pride, struggles to be humble enough, struggles to accept the word of the Lord, to not vaunt themselves and think they're smarter than God. Anyway, verse 23, there was nothing save it was exceeding harshness, preaching and prophesying of wars and contentions and destructions and continually reminding them of death and the duration of eternity and the judgments and the power of God and all these things, stirring them up continually to keep them in the fear of the Lord. <laughs> That's the agenda that he's saying worked. This, this is what worked. There was nothing save it was this harshness, et cetera, et cetera, keeping them continually in the fear of the Lord. I say there was nothing short of these things and exceedingly great plainness of speech would keep them from going down speedily to destruction. So anyway, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? And, and he says, you know, they, they got just way too fat and happy. This is the same concern Brigham Young expressed when he said that one of his great fears was that the saints of this valley, and here I am at the south end of the Salt Lake Valley, <laughs> but wherever we are, right, the saints in the abundant times of Latter-day prosperity would wax fat, grow rich, kick themselves out of the church, and go to hell. <laughs> and, you know, there was reason for that, and this is where we, we need to go sometimes, is to say that, like, no, there are consequences. And, of course, the doctrine of Christ is all about accountability. It's all about accountability, that our actions have consequences and that we need to bring forth the fruits of repentance, be accountable for our choices. Is there always somebody else to blame? Oh, sure. You know, we've talked about that. That's that whole Marxist thing about oppressor and oppressed, where it's like, oh, it's not my fault. Somebody else is responsible. And yes, there are bad people all over the place and bad policies and bad economies. And there's always a reason. And maybe our parents weren't very nice. And, and that's not, I don't mean that that's not a tragedy. I'm just saying ultimately it's looking in the mirror and saying like, this is my life. And if I want to come to Christ, I can, but I have to own the responsibility for my own sins and repent and become a better person. Even if I wasn't taught that as carefully or as well, or it wasn't exemplified for me as well as for others, I still can come to Christ and be healed. And if that takes a little bit of fear of the Lord and the consequences, hallelujah. Hallelujah for it, that we know that there is a day of accountability where we will be judged according to the choices we made and what our capacity was. God will take all that into consideration. Now, we're not going to say too, too much about these next little books. I do want to say a few things like Jerem, for instance, in the book of Jerem, he talks about the Nephites having hard hearts in verse 3. and But there's such a contrast. Just looking at verse 4 for a minute in Jerem, there are many among us who have many revelations, for they are not all stiff-necked. And as many as are not stiff-necked and have communion with the Holy Spirit, there it is again, communion with the Holy Spirit. That's a constant companionship kind of statement there. So anyway, some of them are sanctified, right? Which maketh manifest unto the children of men according to their faith. Well... That's what we've been talking about. But look at the contrast. You've got some Zion people in the midst of Babylon. Where are we today? We have the same opportunity to become Zion people in the midst of Babylon until the day when we're called to be a part of a formal Zion community, but we can become Zion already by seeking sanctification. It's the same path. We want to build Zion. We want to become eligible for Zion. We need to be sanctified. And why? Because only the pure can dwell with Christ. And if we need to be pure in heart, which is the definition of Zion, right? And why? So that Christ can dwell with us. And he cannot dwell with impurity. And what makes us pure? The sanctifying, cleansing power of the Holy Ghost that truly remits our sins through the atonement of Christ. So it's all connected, right? Anyway, here they are, and they're doing a good job, some of them, in the midst of a lot of unrighteousness. So, you know, we don't really have much excuse. You know, if we're waiting for the world to get better, that's not going to happen. 
it's clearly prophesied. Omni, every, anyway, interesting. Here's a little trivia question, right, that we can ask. <laughs> Which book in the Book of Mormon is named after a wicked man, uh, self-described wicked man? And it's the Book of Omni, because he's the first author, and he says this very clearly. Well, he fought with his sword to preserve his people, but in the end, or partway through verse 2, he said, I am of myself a wicked man and have not kept the statutes and commandments of the Lord that I ought to have done. So he gets a whole book named after him, but he is a brief author. Most of them are in the book of Omni. Most of them have just a few things to say as they pass the records on. So we cover a lot of years in this very small, short book. There are five authors in the book of Omni, Omni, Amaron, Chemish, Abinadam and Amalekai. Now, Amalekai, the last of those five authors, writes the majority of this book, which is not very long anyway, but he writes the most. And he's the last writer in the small plates of Nephi. Now, and, and in fact, he mentions that because at the very last verse of Omni, verse 30, toward the end, he says, this is Amalekai, says, I'm about to lie down in my grave and these plates are full. So there's not much space on these plates anymore when these men are writing, and maybe that's one of the reasons they don't repeat all the prophecies and so on, that history of this people has been told, and the doctrine of Christ has been taught. So sometimes they just sort of ratify it or give a little bit of a footnote about things, and then they pass them on. But Amalekai bridges a gap here of several years and puts it rather quickly into the picture of the rest of the Book of Mormon. So he covers some big changes. At some point, and we don't hear exactly when, but they're no longer calling the kings after Nephi. We don't know how many times they did and then at what point they changed, but now they have a king, Mosiah, that Amalekai talks about. Now, this is Mosiah the first that he mentions. And in verse 12, that Amalekai tells us that Mosiah is warned of the Lord that he needs to take his people farther away from the Lamanites. You know, they've all talked about how they had to fight the Lamanites with the sword and there was a lot of bloodshed and so on. But the Lamanites persisted in their everlasting hatred of the Nephites and taught it to the next generation. And this is so sad that we see this throughout the ages of mankind, that sometimes we can really just teach our children to hate. I know, I'm not trying to say that there aren't innocent people amongst the Palestinians, but the Palestinians have cartoons for their children that encourage them and celebrate the killing of Jews. So they are raised with this everlasting hatred of the Jews, just as the Lamanites, without animation, were taught an everlasting hatred of the Nephites. And that does so much evil and damage to the world when children are raised with hate. And it's pretty tough to counteract it. So what a tragedy that this continues in humanity's base potential that it always exists. The natural man can flare up and can be fed. Those appetites can be fed and they can grow. But at any rate, he talks about how Mosiah is warned to take them north and away from the Lamanites, give themselves a little bit of space. And they find the great city of Zarahemla. Now remember that Zarahemla is inhabited by Mulekites. Mulek is the name of the youngest son of King Zedekiah. And King Zedekiah was the last king of the kingdom of Judah. So you remember that back in the Old Testament, near the end of the Old Testament, we have the division of the 12 tribes, and the northern kingdom has 10 tribes, and the southern kingdom has two. And the northern kingdom is called the kingdom of Israel, and the southern kingdom is called the kingdom of Judah. And the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah all have prophets that come and warn them against the wickedness, the worshiping of false gods and the, you know, depriving themselves of the opportunity to be saved because they worship idols and they disobey the commandments of God and sell their birthright for a mess of a pottage, ultimately. The northern kingdom becomes corrupt a little sooner than the southern kingdom. So Assyria sweeps down as prophesied, as they were warned, and takes them captive and the 10 tribes are lost into the north, which now we know is kind of Europe and Eastern Europe. Anyway, most of Ephraim in Western Europe, we've talked about that. And they're the ones who came. And anyway, we'll stop there. But the southern kingdom, which consisted mostly of 
the tribe of Judah with some Benjamin and some Levites. I mean, there were a few that were mixed in because of travel and intermarriage, but mostly the descendants of Judah, so the Jews, lasted a little longer. They weren't quite as ripened in iniquity as soon as the northern kingdom, but eventually they were too. And you know that Jeremiah and Lehi were some of the last prophets that tried to warn the inhabitants of Jerusalem and that southern kingdom to repent or they would be destroyed by Babylon, which they were taken captive. Some, you know, Jerusalem destroyed, the temple destroyed, and the remnant taken captive into Babylon, later allowed to return. Anyway, you know all that, and that set up the timing for Christ to come into a captive nation because eventually after the Babylonians, other dynasties came, you know, Greeks eventually, and the Romans that were in charge when Christ was born. So that's the southern kingdom. But when the Babylonians came in, in order to destroy Jerusalem, and they were a cruel people, I mean, people really who hate can be very depraved and cruel. And what did they do? They took the sons of King Zedekiah and killed them in front of him and then put out the eyes of Zedekiah so that the last thing he saw before he was blinded was the death of his sons. And we don't get the rest of the story in the Old Testament account because the rest of the story is that one of the sons escaped. And his name was Mulek, and he was of the house of Zedekiah. And he, with some small group of people, aided by the hand of the Lord, because we know that he works in these ways, escaped, built some kind of transportation across the ocean, and landed in the Americas, and had built a big city that was Zarahemla. And when King Mosiah is told to go north, they run into Zarahemla, which is a great city. The interesting thing is that they didn't know really very much about their background because they didn't have any records. And we see again the great wisdom in God requiring Nephi and his brothers to go and get the brass plates that had the history of the prophets and the history of the people of Israel. So they had the gospel contained in those records and a knowledge of who they were. And it preserved their language, because when you have a written form, it's a lot harder for the language to change than if it's just unwritten anywhere, no records. So the Nephites meet the Mulekites, and they have records so they can tell them, this is your history, because they know, they hear that they were descendants from Mulek. So, and they can teach them the gospel. Now, my sociologist parents always had an interesting take on things like this. And they would point out that the, when two groups collide, two civilizations collide, the ones with the higher technology always end up in charge. And that's exactly what happened here. I mean, it happened in the colonization efforts of any, like first Great Britain and Spain and other places when they went and found indigenous people somewhere. And of course, England coming to this country and the Native Americans. I mean, the people with the greater technology always win and end up in charge. That's just inevitable. And there is so much repetition of that pattern. And here it is again, even though it, you know, it wasn't a matter of weaponry, perhaps, or things like that, but they had a written record that's higher technology and they knew who they were and their language had not been corrupted. So they end up in charge. So even though they didn't build the city, King Mosiah becomes king of Zarahemla. Kind of interesting. And then we'll point this out again later. But interestingly, a lot of the rebels that appear out of the city of Zarahemla or that fight against the Nephite nation from within, remember that later in the Book of Mormon, we're going to encounter some of these people who go against the government of the Nephites from within the Nephite nation. Computer programs have examined the different names and which language they came from and have found that a lot of those dissenters that cause so much trouble are Mulekite names. And that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because maybe they had a real resentment. Some of them were kind of like, are you kidding? We built this big city and you guys come in and just take over and now you're in charge. So that's kind of fascinating. We'll probably mention that again later. Let's go on. After King Mosiah I, who was a righteous man, is his son, King Benjamin. And we know 
that then will come Mosiah the second, the son of King Benjamin. So we have this dynasty, grandfather, father, son, or father, son, grandson of Mosiah, Benjamin, Mosiah. They are prophet kings. These are righteous men, and they lead their people in righteousness. And these are the last kings of the Nephite people, and we're going to talk about a change of government coming up. Now, this chronology, you know, is kind of a loose summary here, but between Jacob or up to Jacob and Enos, we go from the 600 BC, that is the approximate date of Lehi, because the fall of Jerusalem is like 586 or 587 BC, right? So Lehi and his family are commanded to leave really just about a dozen years or so before the fall of Jerusalem. But coming to the beginning of the Book of Mormon, then about 600 BC. And now the dates at the bottom, which are estimates, of course, but it seems to be that Jacob and Enos kind of wrap up their records between 544 and 421 BC. So that's that's kind of 60 to 180 years. And it takes 138 pages for us to have that record to cover that, say, 100 to 150 years. From Jerem to Amalekai, which is, you know, Jerem to the end of Omni, that's five pages, and it covers 160 to 290 years. <laughs> so, I mean, that's that's kind of amazing, isn't it? So we have a very rapid passage of time in five pages. They're going through many generations, and we had a much more detailed record from the books of Nephi and then Jacob, whose book is much shorter, of course, and then Enos, but still those three generations. Well, two, because, well, Lehi, Nephi, and Jacob being siblings, and then Enos takes 138 pages, but in five pages, we cover a lot of territory and come all the way to the reign of King Benjamin, because we don't hear much more about King Mosiah after this, not Mosiah the first, except that he was righteous enough to be told of the Lord to leave. And he's the one who finds Zarahemla with his people and becomes king of Zarahemla. And then as we begin the book of Mosiah, we're going to start talking about King Benjamin and his great sermon will come up very soon. We know the words of Mormon are a kind of a fascinating little detail here that show again the workings of the Lord that, you know, as I say often, why do we bet against God? He knows stuff. So he always prepares a way for things to work out as they should. And we just have to have the wisdom to be joined up to that plan instead of fighting against it or resisting or rebelling because it's such a waste of time and effort. And we just sell our birthright for Mesopotamia, as we've been talking about. So what happens here? We get Mormon. Now, we know that Mormon is the editor of the book. He's the one who takes all these records and condenses them much longer than could fit in this Book of Mormon. But he edits them, and he sometimes puts his own language in here as editor, which is always a nice point. And, you know, he uses language like, and thus we see. And often that is an indication that now Mormon is going to make an editorial comment. And we'll see that. But he loves these plates. And he sees that there are the large plates of Nephi that have a more complete record of the history of the people. But then these are a choice unto him, he says in this little book, The Words of Mormon. And he says, I don't know why I'm doing this, but it seems a wise purpose. And, and indeed, it is a wise purpose. This is verse 7 of The Words of Mormon. I do this for a wise purpose, for thus it whispereth me, according to to the workings of the Spirit of the Lord which is in me. And now I do not know all things, but the Lord knoweth all things which are to come. Wherefore, he worketh in me to do according to his will. So why did the Lord have Mormon include the small plates of Nephi that finish up with the words of Amalekai? And remember, he runs out of room on the plates. Well, because when these records come forth, Joseph Smith, through the gift and power of the Holy Ghost, and the Urim and Thummim, the tool that is given to him to begin with in the translation, starts to translate these records. And he starts with the large plates of Nephi. And he gets 116 manuscript pages translated 
And then Martin Harris, who was the only guy with money in the early church, especially in those days before the church is organized, but he was a believer and he is supporting Joseph Smith and his new wife, Emma. Joseph doesn't have a way to support. He's putting all his time into the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So who's paying the bills? It's Martin Harris. And Martin Harris is married to a woman who doesn't like Joseph Smith, and she doesn't like the work, and she doesn't like that Martin Harris is spending money to support it. So she's complaining to Martin Harris, and he says to Joseph, please, let me go show her the 116 manuscript pages to show her this great work that is being accomplished with our support financially. And Joseph Smith goes to the Lord and he says, no, no, because what happens? Well, you take that to especially somebody who doesn't like the work and you think she's going to keep them and treat them as something sacred. No, she's going to let them get lost and somebody's going to change the language. And then they're going to say, oh, well, Joseph, you need to translate it again. And if he translates it again, they go, well, see, it's changed. Look at this. You don't know what you're doing. You're just making this up as you go along. And it would destroy the veracity of the Book of Mormon. So Joseph Smith really is feeling pressured because Martin Harris is feeling pressured. And Martin's coming to Joseph. And how, how do you turn to the guy who's funding the entire support of your life and your spouse and say, no, I can't show you? Now, he should have. And he should have said, no, the Lord is not allowing it. We have to wait. When it's all done, she can see it. But I cannot release this now because the Lord had made it very clear. But Martin Harris keeps coming and Joseph Smith caves. Now, this is vastly misunderstood in church history because people say, well, it was the third time and God finally said, go ahead. That's not what happened. And there are some interesting videos on this. And I don't have Anyway, I probably don't have one to link on this, but I know I saw it many years ago, the Joseph Smith Papers discussion, where the more complete story is that Joseph Smith went to the Lord and said, I need to show these to Martin Harris. And the Lord said, then you will need to relinquish the plates. You will need to give back the plates to the angel Moroni and the Urim and Thummim, and you will stop the work until those pages are back untouched or unblemished or whatever. And that didn't happen. But Joseph Smith made that deal. And it was put on him, his shoulders. Joseph Smith made the choice. God didn't say, go ahead, do what you want. Or fine, now I'm going to give you permission, even though just kidding, you're going to get stung. The Lord doesn't play those kinds of games. It was, it was a very straightforward, Joseph, if you choose to do that, you need to relinquish the plates and the Urim and Thummim, et cetera, and give them back into the custody of the angel Moroni because you are, you're doing something that I have asked you not to do. And Joseph Smith did it. He made that deal of his own choice in order to appease Martin Harris, who wanted to appease his wife. And the pages were lost. And it has been suggested, and it was in that video that I watched with those Joseph Smith Papers scholars, that while we often think of Liberty Jail as the worst time and the darkest period of the prophet's life, that it really wasn't. Not that that wasn't a very dark and difficult period, but the worst time for Joseph was when he had given those 116 manuscript pages to Martin Harris, and they were lost. And remember, Martin didn't come when he was supposed to. And Joseph even went to a place closer to where Martin was because he was like, come on. And finally, Martin is approaching the home where Joseph Smith is, and he looks a broken man. His head is downcast. He's so depressed. And Joseph sees him coming and is filled with fear and despair. And when Martin comes, he sees like Martin and he hears this terrible news. He's like, all might be lost. Like I may have lost my calling. How, how could this happen? Because I went against what the Lord told me and risked all of this. And now I have lost the ability to do this work. And he didn't know if it would be restored to him again, that he could go back to translating 
And it took a while before the Lord gave him that power again. So Joseph felt like maybe he had actually blown his foreordained calling to be the prophet of the restoration. And it makes sense that that would be the darkest period of Joseph's life. Liberty Jail, even though a terrible dungeon, a terrible experience, and certainly heart-wrenching and refining in really extreme ways, was not a time he had lost the favor of the Lord. He may not have felt the presence of the Lord, as I've talked about last week. His experience was not coinciding with his knowledge. He knew that God is kind. He knew that God is always to be trusted, and yet he felt abandoned. He felt alone. But he knew he was still on the Lord's side. And with the loss of the 116 manuscript pages, he knew he had gone against the counsel of the Lord. So let's get that story straight when we talk to our children about it or when we talk about it in church. It wasn't that like, well, if you keep asking the Lord, he's finally going to just say, okay, go do what you want. The Lord doesn't do that. I mean, he may back up and say like, yeah, I'm not going to insist. And that's exactly what happened. I command and men obey not. This is section 58 in the DNC. I've quoted this many times. It has great application. I command and men obey not. I revoke and they receive not the blessing. The Lord won't argue with us. And that's what happened. He's not going to argue with Joseph. I've told you already, this is not the right thing to do, but you're going to go do this. That's on you. And you will relinquish this power until those things come back. Or eventually you repent. And then because Joseph Smith did repent in sackcloth and ashes and in extreme pain, in a way that refined and changed him and made him more committed to God. You remember that great counsel, the Lord says, thou should not have feared man more than me. <laughs> Who are you really afraid of? And now I'm sorry, but we're back to David Archuleta and his mother. Thou should not have feared man more than me. Like, who are we most concerned about offending? It needs to be the Lord. It needs to be our Heavenly Father. Who's on the Lord's side? And that is the side that will prevail. That's the side that will always bring us to growth and to joy. Okay, I could go off forever on these topics. As you know, let's mention just a couple of other things. I'm going to spend a little time doing some extra content right after this about critical thinking and about being rational. There was a fun little bit that I read about the literacy in the early American period, and I want to share that and tie it into what we've talked about, about being good thinkers and helping our children become critical thinkers so that they're not duped by the sophistry in the world. And this is a fun little enticement. Thought I might get to it, but it's going to have to go into extra content. <laughs> enticement to learn and study and be critical thinkers and to obtain knowledge. I will do a little just taste of where this leads to because I think it's important and I will talk about it more in that extra content. But I was talking with one of my daughters just a couple of days ago, Caitlin, and and then I got a chance to talk to my son. Great about this too, but how we are in an information age that is beyond compare. I mean, this is an incredible time where we can pick up our phones or you know go to our computer, or, you know, but right there in our hands with our smartphones we can access information that is just unbelievable. I mean, our kids don't even understand how we used to go to the library to look at the encyclopedias and the reference books because they can pull it up in a Google search. I mean, it's astonishing how much information is available right in our hands and at the tip of a finger. It's extraordinary. You can't possibly absorb all the information. And yet truth is as scarce as it has ever been or more. Our whole society seems to be ever learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. I mean, we are being sold a bill of goods right and left. The sophistry is everywhere. Evil agendas are everywhere. We listen to the news. We listen to all these voices. But do we know if they're speaking the truth? So 
in these conversations I was having with a couple of my kids, we were talking about that, how we, again, let's talk about the gift and power of the Holy Ghost. This is from Moroni 10, verse 5. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, ye may know the truth of all things. Do you remember that Heber C. Kimball said in the early days of the restoration, the day will come when no man can stand on borrowed light. He was talking about us and our day. All of this information, but where is truth? And quick thought from George Orwell. The more society drifts from truth, the more it will hate those who proclaim it. There's something to chew on for a moment. Well, we had some wonderful conference thoughts, and I just wanted to end with this thought. I mean, of course, there was a lot of talk about covenants and the power in the temple and wearing our garments, two different speeches that mentioned that, one of them President Oaks. But a lot of the messages also dealt with the subject of maintaining our faith and our trust in God through trials. There were several talks that talked about that, and they were tender as I listened, and I did shed some tears from time to time. There were at least two mentions of Job. There were at least two different mentions of Liberty Jail. So that was a repeated topic, and it it has been a topic forever, but it seems that it's right for our times because it's the last days and perilous times have come. Now, I'm going to have to look harder for this. I did spend a little time, but I couldn't find it quickly, but I will eventually because I'll review the talks. And somebody quoted somebody. Hmm. That's pretty bad, isn't it? (laughs) Maybe you remember. And this is a paraphrase. But when we see the reward that God has for us in the next life, we'll wonder at how small the price was to be paid. And that was a beautiful thought. I've heard it before. Should memorize it this time, shouldn't I? And I will find it and I'll quote it better another time. But what a great reminder that in the midst of perilous times and tribulations and trials of all kind, that there really is a greater work being done in us that prepares us for things that the eye hath not seen, neither ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man that those are the things that God has prepared for those that love him. And we will wonder why the price was so small when we have a full enjoyment of all that God wants to give us if we just have the willingness to submit and believe in him and his son and in their love for us and trust that their path is the path that leads to life and salvation. We can do it, brothers and sisters. We can choose glory. We can build Zion. Thanks as ever to my husband, Chris Anderson, and to Doug Larson of Point Digital. Take care.